So any lover of literature will tell you that a good title is important. The title is important because it captures your attention and it tells you something fundamental about the piece that it's naming. And so we have here in today's gospel reading a parable that has a title. It's not just a name that's given by a translation committee or a publisher of a certain version of a Bible, but it's an actual title given by Jesus himself, the parable of the sower. This title communicates to us that the sower is a significant part of this parable. At first glance, it seems like an odd choice for a name because for being a parable that's called the parable of the sower, this story doesn't actually spend much time talking about the sower. It doesn't give many details about the sower. We're told that the sower is the one who sows seeds and he does so pretty liberally, but that's all we hear about the sower. We hear much more about the places where the seeds fall and what happens to the seeds once they fall, once they hit the ground. Some of the seeds fall along the path, they get eaten by birds. Some fall on rocky soil and because they don't have deep roots, they get scorched by the sun after they quickly sprout up. Others fall among thorns and the thorns choke the life out of them. And finally, some, fall on good soil, and those are the ones that bear fruit and bear it abundantly. It seems like a more fitting name for this parable might be the parable of the seeds or maybe the parable of the soils. If anything, the soil is what we should be paying attention to in this story, right? Because it's the soil that determines whether the seeds flourish. It's the same sower throughout and the same seeds throughout, but unless those seeds fall on good soil, they're vulnerable to elements that seek to harm them. In his explanation of this parable, Jesus remarks that the seeds are the word of the kingdom and the good and understand his word. Once we have this bit of information, it becomes clear to us that Jesus is the sower. But even though good soil is crucial, as Elizabeth Johnson rightly points out, Jesus doesn't use this parable to exhort hearers to be good soil, as though we could make that happen. This parable is not a lesson in how to improve our soil. It's not about proper techniques for watering or fertilization or tilling. Either soil is good or it isn't. Either people hear and understand the word that's proclaimed to them or they don't. In the parable of the sower, a significant portion of seeds don't make it. The seeds scattered on the path are the ones that are eaten by the birds, and those are uh, those who the evil one snatches away the word that's sown in their heart. The plants growing in rocky soil that are scorched by the sun are those who hear the word, and initially they receive it with joy, but they cannot withstand troubles and persecution. Plants choked by thorns are those who are caught up by the cares of the world and the lure of wealth. Only the seeds sown on good soil become plants that produce a harvest. When you think about it, that's a lot of failure for what seems like a few results. Matthew's gospel reinforces this imagery of rejection in showing us how Jesus the sower is received when he proclaims the word of the kingdom. In Matthew 12, shortly before his address to the crowd, which includes the parable from today's gospel reading, Jesus faces the displeasure of the religious leaders after allowing his disciples to pluck heads of grain and eat them on the Sabbath. The religious leaders perceive Jesus' claim to be the Lord of the Sabbath as this kind of threat. And in Matthew 13, after Jesus has finished his time of teaching, he travels to his hometown of Nazareth, and there he is rejected. People cannot accept that someone they think they know so well could produce such wisdom and deeds of power. And while it's true that Jesus does attract large crowds of people who are eager to hear him speak, he explains to his disciples that the reason he speaks in parables is because most of the people who are listening are incapable of understanding his message. Jesus describes them in this way. Seeing they do not perceive and hearing, they do not listen, nor do they understand. And what about Jesus' inner circle, his disciples? The ones to whom he's chosen to reveal the meaning of his parables. 
After Jesus has told these series of parables that we read in Matthew 13, he asks his disciples if they've understood all this. And their answer is, yes, of course we have. But their actions in response to Jesus' arrest, running away in fear and abandoning him in his greatest moment of need, these actions reveal just how little the disciples understand. People rejecting the word of the kingdom and seeds falling on bad soil. Why then does Jesus tell this parable, if not to help us identify what type of soil we might be, or to illustrate the sheer number of people who aren't ready to receive the word of the kingdom? Jesus tells this parable for the same reason he tells his other parables, to paint a picture of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God like? It's like a sower who sows seeds freely, some might even say wastefully. As it turns out, the parable of the sower really is about the sower. In this parable, we see a sower that is generous and extravagant. The word of the kingdom, the good news is proclaimed to all. Seeds are vulnerable, soil may or may not be good, and dangers are all around. But our hope is found in the generosity of the sower. Our hope is found in a sower who makes the good news of the gospel available to all, even for those not yet ready to receive it. This is the gift of grace. Christ declares, let anyone with ears listen as the crowd is gathered around him to hear his parable. He knows that many of them aren't actually listening, or they might listen and forget, or listen but fail to respond in any meaningful way but he makes the message available to all. He proclaims the good news of the kingdom to religious leaders who are antagonistic towards him, to curious crowds, to people who are in need of healing, to outcasts, to earnest seekers, and to 12 disciples. He knows that in his hour of death, most of these people will either turn on him or abandon him, but his message is for all and on the cross, he pours himself out for all. And when Christ is raised from the dead on the third day, those with ears to hear, those who have been paying attention, they will be the ones to respond with joy. And the word of the kingdom begins to spread just as the sower intended. Our hope is found in the sower who is willing to sow seeds in places that others would deem inhospitable or unsuitable. The seeds aren't hoarded and carefully measured out only on the healthiest, most promising soil. It's scattered in unlikely places along pathways and among rocks and thorns. This allows for the possibility that life might spring up in unexpected places, like a tree that grows out of the roof of a courthouse. Christ brought the word of the kingdom, not just to the religious and social insiders, but to those on the margins. Prostitutes, drunkards, tax collectors, Gentiles, lepers. I think of the interaction that Jesus has with a Samaritan woman in John's gospel. A more meticulous sower wouldn't have had a conversation at a well with a Samaritan woman. He wouldn't have wasted good seeds on this kind of soil. The Samaritans didn't worship God the right way or in the right place. They were the enemy. And even if you thought it was worth changing their hearts and minds, you wouldn't go about doing it by having a conversation with a woman who was coming to a well by herself in the middle of the day. You'd have a conversation with someone who had much more social standing and social capital, who could help you get your message across. But Jesus wasn't a meticulous sower. He sowed the seeds of the kingdom freely and recklessly. So a conversation with one Samaritan woman turned into a conversion, and she introduced her whole city to Christ. Seeds flourishing in unlikely soil. And I think of Peter, the disciple who loved to make bold claims and who stepped out of the boat to walk on the water toward Jesus, but who buckled at the first signs of pressure, not only running away when Jesus was arrested, but denying that he even knew him. A more meticulous or careful sower would have 
passed Peter over, dismissing him as a liability, choosing a more trustworthy person on which to build his church. But Christ chose Peter and remained faithful to him even when Peter wavered. And Peter, the disciple who denied Christ, became the disciple who preached on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people welcomed the word of the kingdom and were baptized, seeds flourishing in unlikely soil. Because our hope lies in the generosity of the sower, the good news for us is that it's not our job to determine who is worthy of the message of the gospel or who is most likely to bear fruit. It's not our job to predict outcomes or to decide who may be receptive to the work of God. As members of the body of Christ who have been given the Great Commission, we are called to be sowers, to proclaim the gospel freely. The good news is for everyone. We are not the source or the keepers of the gift. We are merely passing on what we have received, sharing freely because we ourselves have been shown grace freely. And because our hope lies in the generosity of Christ the sower, we can rest in one final truth, that ultimately his word will bear fruit. God's kingdom will come. The seeds aren't sown in vain. In the light of this good news, let us examine our own hearts, asking God to transform the areas of our lives in which we are not yet ready to receive his word. The parts of us that struggle to understand, that are weighed down by the cares of this world, that struggle to remain faithful to the values of God's kingdom. And as we trust in the transforming work of the sower, let us give thanks for a God. His word will not return void. Thanks be to God.